one of the interesting things we are hoping to address as we think through this initiative is how to get primary care and community services integrated as part of the initiative to support end of life. Normal. Um, the point is that many end of life care situations end up badly because carers are unprepared for it. Or they just land in them and just sort of suddenly find they're a carer and never really knew what that was. And without this preparation, it's consequently they miss opportunities to do good and to prevent the harm and very often themselves becoming ill uh, as a result. This is a very common thing. And often patients, people, people dying at home end up in hospices and hospitals, um, not through intention, but because the carers find it too difficult to continue. So we think that by helping the carers to develop a supportive community around the dying person, we can change this. And we proposed three phases. Now, there's no intention to rush this. <clears throat> um, but the first phase will be a low effort project in which the involved people will contribute to discussions about what is it that would help the blind carers. First, sorry, another part of that first phase will be, so what are the practical issues in the systems to make it work? Um, for example, the issues of primary care community services, um, for example, um, access to knowledge and uh, carers for crisis management and so on. And then in that first part, we'll work with Marie Curie and the RCGP to develop materials that will dovetail with their daffodil standards. Now, Julie Pierce, who is the chief nurse for Marie Curie, who I think is also going to be joining us shortly, and Catherine Millington Sanders, who's a national lead for the RCGP, will hopefully be joining us as well. But they have already agreed that they are supporting this initiative. And our job is to work with their eight standards, the daffodil standards, to see ways in which we can incorporate the work that we're doing with them. So it becomes an add-on to what they're doing. So that's part of phase one. Um, the second phase, will be to take that to um, a whole primary care network. Whatever we end up with on phase one, we'll take to a primary care network. And then whenever that is possible, help all practices in that network to be able to adopt whatever we've worked out in stage one. And the third phase will be to apply lessons learned to other primary care network functions, including shared care and self-care for people with long-term conditions. And maybe then we may be able to achieve something else. And that is to develop the carers that we've developed along the way as agents of change throughout the primary care networks. Now, look, we may be, this may be several years later, but these individual carers by then will have learned the skills and techniques of managing, building a community around their patient. And those skills are not about end of life. They're about relationship building, community development, personal development. And if they have gained the confidence of doing that, they may well become the basis of a network of people inside a primary care network, such as the one that Ajit and Nigel are leading, <clears throat> in order to become like grassroots facilitators inside the community, already with their development of um, a community around their particular area, linking with all the other places that are doing ever such similar work um, in one way or another, to develop that sense that actually making communities work inside a primary care network is really feasible and, um, and, and, and going to be fun too. So the materials we're going to develop will focus on how to build that supportive community around the dying person to be here tonight <clears throat> is Senan Devendra, who is um, working with the University of Brunel to develop a medical uh, curriculum, a new medical school, inside which they're going to put these skills and techniques. And he's working with the palliative care team at um, Hillingdon, Ricky Bannessy. Now, uh, Nigel knows Ricky Bannessy, <clears throat> and that's maybe some other people too, but he's been uh, working with the West London Research Network for nearly 25 years now. And this covers the whole of West London and is now part of the WHO um, Collaborating Centre and brings with it Imperial College. So this project has also got their blessing and support 
So that will bring with it a technical connection with all of the 500 general practices in uh, West London, which is an area of 2 million people as well, um, as well as CLCH, in order to bring them into it. Now, if we can get all these places agreeing that these skills matter, we are very far away, far towards being able to describe this as something that citizens require, actually. And we can now start talking about how it can be taught in schools to four-year-olds and five-year-olds, because this is not really about end of life, Ken, it's not really about postgraduate stuff. It's about ordinary common sense, about how you develop sustainable relationships with people in order to build families, trust, um, love, care, you know, caring, compassionate communities, um, healthy communities, and so on. Um, Ricky can't be here, he was going to be here tonight, but he, I know he can't be here because he's entertaining somebody from Mauritius um, who is talking to him about how um, these kind of ideas of developing community of, about healthcare can find its way into the 16 um, Southern African countries healthcare systems. So another place where all these kind of skills are being just described in, in, in different places. Um, now there's two other people to mention before I stop talking or maybe more, just, I'll start off with two. Um, Locally, as well as the general practice, and we heard from uh, Nigel and, and um, Ajit already, <clears throat> there's um, a wonderful um, uh, undertaker around the corner from here where the Lady Bernadette <clears throat> is on a train tonight, so she can't be with us. Uh, but she's very fully signed up to this. And essentially, they're doing the same thing. People go into them to say, well, we want to do um, advanced care planning uh, for it as a funeral thing. And then she will then be act as a counsellor for them. And as she's told me that she sits in front of these different parts of the warring family. That, and then she'll say, I'm sorry, I just can't do this with you if you can't agree. If you're going to just find fault with each other and not agree with each other, it's not possible to find a unified um, plan. So go away and come back when you've done that. So, And then later on, when somebody has died, uh, she said, then they come back and back and back. Because they, they they find it easier to come here than, let's say, the GP or the counsellor. So they, too, are doing the jobs that lots of other people are doing as well. And so she talks about the people with grief and complicated grief that she sees years after they come by and just have to talk again to her. And then the other person who I, again, hope is coming tonight is Jay, Jacintendra ja Kachela, a pharmacist, um, who is, um, might actually be him just joining there. Anyway, I'll carry on. Who says a very similar thing? You know, people, once you befriend someone, they come to trust you and you come to get your palliative care meds from the, the, the pharmacist. Well, then they're your cancer advisor and they're the person that whose shoulder you cry on. And they can point out where these um, that this, this literature is on, um, let's say, the daffodil standards on the Marie Curie site. Well, we're going to end up teaching the end-of-life carers at home who've just been landed into it are going to look awfully similar to the skills that professional carers will be looking at, will be awfully similar to the skills we're going to produce in that those modules inside this new medical school curriculum. Uh, but uh, yeah, my name is Jitendra. I am the, the pharmacist in charge at Greenfield Pharmacy, which is based on uh, Chamberlain Road in Kensal Rise. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to attend this meeting. I um, had a long discussion with uh, Dr. Thomas about uh, what is involved in this project. Uh, very interesting. Um, and obviously, it's very, very emotional, a very emotional journey for people who are having to go through it. Um, we have a good understanding uh, from the medical part of uh, point of view, because we already take part in the, in the palliative care service, um, which is actually something that's been organized by the, uh, the Brent CCG. Um, and uh, by the uh, by the Brent uh, sorry Harrow and Brent LPC as well. So from that point of view, we have good understanding from the from the medicine point of view. But we also are in a position to offer support to people who may need um, to gain an understanding of what would be involved uh, for patients undergoing this pathway. And I think you also mentioned something the other day about cultural differences. Could you just give an insight into how, what you see from that point of view? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. So um, obviously, you know, we, we see people from a lot of backgrounds and from personal experiences as well. 
um, we find that when, when we're talking of cultural differences, particularly in, in our community, uh, people find it very difficult, one, to express and obviously seek out for support. Um, I mean, they know that support is available, but, they, but then again, you know, there's overwhelming information available, both from the hospital end, the community end. Um, and we find that, you know, certain sectors of the community find it very difficult to accept what is going on and also to seek out for support. Oh, really, thank you. Um, just that the agenda around integration has never been more prominent, um, irrespective of what care pathway we're talking about. So, I mean, everything we're talking about here this evening is um, hugely pertinent to a lot of the work we're trying to achieve at CLCH. Um, and yeah, everything that we can do uh, for our carers um, to support their loved ones um, in giving the most comfortable possible end of life, um, we're all for 100%. And, uh, the daffodil standards for um, those of you who haven't um, haven't seen them are a evidence-based structured approach to helping a GP practice consistently offer end of life care um, to patients. Um, and I did post a link in the chat. Um, that link has been recently updated. It's um, with Marie Curie, but um, we, Catherine Millington Saunders is actually being interviewed um, in some of the videos at the top of that page. And she can't be with us tonight, um, but we have been uh, working with her and others um, around the, the daffodil standards as communicating part of what we're talking about. But of course, not everything is, as Paul has been saying. Um, um, okay. But by way of introduction, because I, I do know one or two people either through Coin or some long-standing colleagues, like David Colling Tomey, who I've put to sleep many a time. Um, I'll see if I can keep him awake this time, though. But uh, my background, uh, albeit as a clinician, I stepped down from clinical practice, um, from my practice at the end of 2020. Uh, I'd done about half a million consultations by then, I think, uh, in my 38 years in clinical practice, 31 of which was in, in general practice. But uh, having stepped down from clinical practice, there's still a, a, a full portfolio I'll be coming to the, the National Programme on Health and Equalities, but uh, on Wednesday I go off to India, uh, where I'm the primary care lead for a, a faculty for disaster medicine um, for India and Nepal. So we've got a, a programme with the Royal College of Surgeons that, that I'm uh, leading on, on the primary care aspect. Um, I still do some undergraduate teaching and some clinical research now in the University of Central Lancashire, where I'm a, a, a clinical professor in the School of Medicine. And I also uh, manage a digital clinical excellence forum, which uh, networks all the medical leadership from the independent providers of online services. So everyone from Boots to Asda to Babylon and many of the names you'll have heard, big, big providers in the independent sector. But we've managed to network them so there's a consistency and approach to quality and safety. And we're actually setting some industry standards with GPHC now for, for online pharmacy. But what's been live now, funded through the NHS, is a national programme we've called the Complete Care Community Programme. It is looking at health inequalities in all seven regions of England. Um, and whilst there's nothing new in the approach to ta ta tackling health inequalities, it does seem to be with the new architecture of the NHS uh, higher on the list than it's been before. It's always featured in uh, policy approaches, whatever policies come through for the NHS, whether it be looking at improving access, looking at competition, plurality provision, there's always, and we must make sure that we don't widen the gap with health inequalities, which we've consistently uh, widened year on year for a long time. In, in, indeed, if you look at some of the current research, um, Michael Marmot, so Michael Marmot, who in 2010 produced quite a damning report at the extent of health inequalities in England. Um, and 10 years on, uh, the uh, Health Foundation asked him to do a review of what had happened in the 10 years from his first report. And what he found was that um, things had got worse. 
for the first time in over 100 years, life expectancy in England has stalled. Um, the social gradient's getting steeper. We're talking about all sorts of other inequalities now, whether it be rural, coastal, whatever the fuel crisis is going to do. But whatever we've been doing, even though there's been some great people um, doing some great work in local areas, local quality improvement projects, what it hasn't done is, as a system or as a nation, reduced that, that health inequality gap. And I say we're, we're seeing quite marked regional differences, but all of those differences are, are widening. And um, whether the development of place-based systems, integrated care systems, will really address this, what we've tried to do is produce uh, a project which will be moving into research, but um, it is just being evaluated at this time in the approach that is being taken to address health inequalities in local areas anchored around primary care networks. Um, there's another programme nationally called the Core 20 plus 5. This is... Um, a more mechanistic program, a national program. It's it's quite prescriptive in how it's it's um, focusing, uh, but again, being run by NHS England Centre, and we're aligned with this. Is the sort of narrative we've said to say that the, the complete care community program is completely aligned with a national program, but it is um, focusing slightly different areas of care, and it is a learning network rather than just a spread program. Um, the exam question that uh, was set going back to mom and lots of others is why are we failing when we have such um, good examples in, in not far from me there's something which has been rightly applauded awarded um, articulated called the Wigan deal it was a compact created by a, a local council looking at the health of Wigan residents and trying to connect issues that the wider determinants of health and how they could be addressed between the the, the public uh, council services and health and it started to show improvement in healthy living in Wigan the problem we have with particularly the NHS or even projects like this it's the Wigan deal and since that time there's no Bolton deal Berry deal Preston deal any deal and we do this very often, create bespoke projects. We um, give them an award, we hear about them, but we don't apply the science of spread or understand what needs to be scaled or how to adopt what has been factors which are more generic rather than just local. And we, have a, we are blighted in the NHS with the not made here syndrome, which I first experienced as a a GP in Wallasey, in the, the, the northeast tip of the, the Wirral Peninsula, probably not articulating it in my younger days well, but, you know, um, uh, talking about some of the work we'd done in Wallasey and colleagues quickly said, it will never work here, though, um, in Birkenhead. We've got a very, very different population three miles down the road. And we, he we hear that too often. So the the focus of this Complete Care Community Programme is whatever you're doing, whatever the complex care need, whatever the inequality you're looking at, can we have a consistent design? What are the uh, enablers and barriers so that we can start to design projects, whatever the, the complex area and whatever the co complex issue, whatever the area, we can apply some evidence to uh, the, and we, we, we produced our first report that is starting to look at everything from the humanistic factors of the people who are driving these projects because it is largely driven by small groups of enthused individuals and we are going where there, there is the energy. But there's lots of these people about. Um, but these are the, the other just um, purpose uh, that uh, we're, we are um, looking into. This act like a sector is that we generally even if we have a national contract for particular projects, most are just individual QI projects. We don't apply the science of learning and we use the term innovation quite loosely throughout the NHS that you know, if we say it enough times, we will be in innovative. But often what we, what we find with innovation is lots of invention. But the important thing about innovation is that 
lots of people are inventing things. What we don't do is understand how to adopt the important factors which can be spread and when to scale projects. Are we scaling for the, the right people and the right service? And sometimes we don't look into that in any scientific way. We just say it looks good to us. Let's have a national, a, a national approach to it. So we've got demonstrator sites throughout England. It started in the Northwest. All, all regional offices have, have, have uh, funded some of the demonstrator sites as a contribution to allow them some headroom, not to actually deliver new care, but at least to do the, what we're calling field work, which um, uh, builds into an evaluation. And we do have a, a, an NIHR a bid in which has been successful it's been out to competition unfortunately um the applicants we did have a few applicants the uh, nihr board did not feel that they were of a, a quality that they could um appoint them at this stage so we're going round the circle again but that will happen after we've done our second evaluation so we'll get into the the, the sites being involved in a a research program um i do like my quotes um, one of the uh, the gurus uh, that um, possibly was the, the father of mo modern consultancy, but um, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. It, it, are we getting poor outcomes from from our approaches to health inequalities because we have a, a scattered approach to uh, the, de the, the design of projects? And our projects, I was worried at the first because in each of the sites, it is a handful of people. Sometimes it's the clinical director from the primary care network. Some are being led by social prescribers. But whatever, there's, there's rarely more than three or four people we meet from any site on a regular basis who are really driving this forward. But you know, Margaret Mead, a social anthropologist, maybe had it where we were saying you know, that, that a, a small group of committed citizens changed the world. And can we think of any change of world that was done by committee or board? Um, so we are supporting relatively small groups uh, within each project, but there's lots of the, th these people. So we have anchored it in primary care networks. The design is saying before you deliver anything, because the other thing I've noticed in my time in the, primary, in, in the health service, we have an unmet need or a gap in need or a perceived problem, and we quickly develop a service without really getting into the depths of understanding the, the debility or what that gap is. So we have an approach sometimes, I'm generalising, it's a little bit unfair, but um, it's like the field of dreams, you know, build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. And so we design a service based on, uh, uh, we think a need, an un unmet need, and who turns up but the health literate, the ones who always turn up, the ones who know about it. And when we talk about hard to reach, and I make no apology about saying hard to reach, when I started this programme, we got into all sorts of semantics around it. We shouldn't be saying hard to reach. It should be hardly reached. And who's hard to reach? And bottom line is whatever we, we, we say, there are groups of people in our society, whether it's health inequity or health inequality, they, for whatever reason, don't access services or the services don't provide for their needs. We lose them. Sometimes they're hiding from us. And whatever service we design, unless we know about these groups of people, really understand and listen to to why that they are excluded um, we may never produce the right service so the design uh, taking a population health analytical approach a, a clearly defined group of people who have similar debility i'm saying in greater manchester that debility may be lack of shelter but do we know each and every one some who are hiding for reasons that um, maybe because they're illegal immigrants or what but can we somehow understand the extent of the debility for each and every one in a population group look at the risk uh, within that group and then start to design service from a deep understanding of that particular need not a lot new for those who are uh, well versed in population health and its management um, but the other thing is we we want to start to evaluate some of the issues in the design at a very early stage and i say we've produced our first report um i won't dwell on this but these are again well-known principles um, but the things we are saying to sites who sometimes say we've not been able to progress at all 
over the period of the last month from, from the last meeting. It was interesting when talking with NHS England, they were saying, should we start to rag rate the development of these demonstrator sites that we're investing? I pushed back quite hard on that because I was saying, how do you rag rate somebody who says, well, I've not been able to do anything for a month? Because I would rag rate that green because we need to know why it's so difficult when complex care, we, we all know that the, the increased need, but why wouldn't a site be able to do any work for a month? It was in, uh, when I first uh, came across this where a site said, I'm sorry, we, we've, we've just not been able to because business as usual is so busy. They were looking at um, uh, an agenda of troubled families. The troubled families agenda actually isn't, isn't through the DHSC, it's through the, um, uh, I forget what they've renamed, the MHCLG, uh, uh, which is the, was the Ministry of, of Local Authorities, Housing, um, and communities, um, but they had a, a group of trouble families with children with quite complex mental health problems who, like many of those, they, they go to bed at night with their bellies empty. But they had to take a back step from looking after these people, the families, because business as usual was directing them through their contractual requirements to do other things, which was sort of a, a light bulb moment saying, Wow, is that our allocative value in our healthcare system? That the hard to reach populations, because there's no financial flow or, or direction through contracts, is that a, a major issue? Um, but anyway, we, we've um, been looking into all sorts of issues that uh, prevent um, or barriers for the NHS to look at these complex care issues. And we are because it's being funded through the NHS and we are saying we want to look at the extent of which the NHS can address health inequalities in the knowledge that with the wider determinants, there's a huge amount that can't be managed by the NHS, but there's more than we think. You, you, you see variable reports about the, the health inequalities, which is always related to education, shelter, nutrition. We, we know all the, these wider determinants, but, People don't die of lack of shelter. That may be an underlying reason that they get a terminal illness, but is a, it is usually a health issue, which leads them to either attend A and E, be in a hospital bed, go and see their GP, etc. Um, so we're saying no one gets it right first time, and we need to learn from those who are saying we're really struggling to do this. Um, the sites we've got now, we've we've got forty six active sites. We were struggling because Greater Manchester sometimes declares UDI from the, the regional structure, but we are looking at three sites now being developed in Greater Manchester as well as the 46. So we're, we're, we're probably, those rather than a spread programme, keep it around the 50 mark. There, there are other enthusiasts who want to join this particular programme network and at the moment uh, evaluation approach. But when we get into the research phase, which may be another year off, there's a, a limit to how much research could be done if it was a spread program we end up with hundreds of sites so we, we are going to limit the number of sites within it because we've got the core 20 plus 50 another approach which is a spread program throughout england uh, being managed by nhs england um in this we've looked at we have we, we've had two phases we had 26 sites in the first phase another 20 have, have come on board and we, we say we, we're taking another three or four on now um uh, our first report, which I'd be happy to share, I can put the, uh, the link online, um, has started to find consistencies in design which can be transferred. So whether you're looking at sex workers in, Manche uh, in Newcastle or um, uh, rural deprivation in Cumbria, people without shelter on the, on the south coast, mental health uh, in, or, or travellers' uh, health in, in Truro, and these are sites that we've got. There are some factors that uh, have been noted that may be issues around how you sustain approach and transfer the learning, because we think the transferability of the work leads to sustainability. Um, so we are finding in the, re the report that there are some um, interesting factors, for example, uh, and, and some things that we, we hadn't probably addressed before um, I mentioned rural deprivation in Cumbria. Interesting, one of the, the factors that we found 
or they've been finding that they they've been looking at why in, in a, an area of rural deprivation the conversion they, they've got a very high um, instance of pre-diabetes but they have a very high conversion rate to type 2 diabetes and they're not quite sure why and one of the early factors they've found which is significant in that conversion is where the bus stop is now in my clinical practice i'd never thought about managing where the bus stop was to prevent the progression of diabetes but again there's a lot more complexity to it but one of the issues is their arrangements to get to the place of care whether it be their general practice many miles away or a hospital um for colleagues in the us you know when we talk about many miles away in britain of course it's it's 30 miles not 300 miles um but it's still in england a long way if people choose not to go because of the distance there isn't public transport um they haven't got the resources to pay to to get to the place of care the only time that they do is when they call the ambulance because their toes have gone black. Um, it's interesting now that there's an interesting discussion between the local authority, the primary care network, to look at how transfer of patients to places of care can be improved and people given information, the resources, the education, which they think may be as big a factor as when they get to their place of care and have their, their medical treatment. Um, one site today in central Liverpool, we're talking about um, the uh, a group of people who are dis disadvantaged in inner city Liverpool. It's uh, males of Afro-Caribbean uh, um, descent who have great difficulty accessing the NHS. They do not register with a general practice. Sometimes they, they feel, um, Paul, you'll have experienced this, that, that they aren't welcome. They don't have um, easy access to it. What they were finding that registration with a general practice, there was, I can't remember the exact factor, but the, the suicide risk, if you weren't registered, was something like 10 times greater in that group of people than if you were registered. And I, I never thought registration with a general practice would reduce your risk of suicide. Now, I know there's a lot more complexity, but it's some interesting factors that can be fixed by the NHS. They're doing a project to reach out, have different ways of registering, helping people get into a healthcare system and have screening at the point at which they have that first discussion. I, I could go on through the four to six sites, but I won't, um, because it is um, uh, in, in the first report. These were just some of the identifiable factors in the, in the early stages. Um, we always talk about leadership. It's a, an interesting style of leadership in most of the sites. It's definitely not positional, you know, the, the positional versus purposeful, but it's interesting that some of the clinicians have taken positional leadership roles only to be able to do this because they didn't have a voice in the system. So it's to do nothing other than the NHS only recognises the voice of the person with a position and they've taken that on not to be in charge or control, but to be able to deliver care in ways that they couldn't do previously. James, and thank um, you very much for that. <clears throat> Ross Chantek was going to be with us tonight and he was going to say <clears throat> what they did in Ealing was identify for diabetes when they were did a complex intervention, the kind of which you're describing, like asking people what things like bus stops need to be changed in order to improve diabetes care comes out of <clears throat> the, the, the that kind of listening collaborative approach. Can, the effect of it can be done by um, gaining reports from routinely gathered data that can be applied to primary care network areas and show the changes in overall statistics like hospital admissions from a collaborative approach. So that's uh, an amazing thing, that new thing that could be done these days. And of course, it was Carl Wake who talked about uh, leadership as sense making. Leadership is not a heroic person up the front, but somebody who helps people to make sense of what's right, going on. They're there. helping with the NIHR bid. Um, and I've had occasional discussions with them. And I, I usually get the, you know, OK, James, give me the one big factor that you would change you know, that you're finding at the moment to help particularly primary care networks address health inequalities. And the, the answer was get rid of the GP contract because 
Um, what it does is direct the day-to-day -day activity of clinical teams in ways that sometimes produce outcomes for the service rather than, okay, I'm not saying that, we, that you know, we shouldn't get hospital waiting lists down, but if, we, if we're doing that at the expense of doing something else, that levelling up is, you know, we, we've got to look at um, the, the value in healthcare and how we allocate our resources. In the moment, we're going to allocate all the resources to get waiting lists down for routine hip and knee replacements, for example. Really important if you're suffering with that, but if, if that's where our value is and saying, well, we've got to put all our resources into that and leave those who are suffering because of deprivation or we haven't got a mechanism to fund work in those areas, uh, the, the choices that are being made. But it's, it's sometimes the... the the forgotten choice. If, if I may come back, I think what you're um, speaking about is something I feel strongly that, that the government like to direct um, resources to things which can be counted. And it's easy to put a headline out that we've done so many hips and knees and reduced a waiting list. Um, the meaningful outcomes of um, overall health, well being, um, and um, the, the prevalence of, of illnesses and disease groups rather than the end outcome of death is, is, is much harder to measure. Thank you. Martin. Uh, sorry, to Laura, go on. Well, Sanjay was waiting, and I think he finally has his mic off. <laughs> or uh, mic on. Can, can, you hear, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, keep going. Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear okay. I, in the early days of this network, we talked about the power of stories. And when James was talking, particularly when he was talking about the plight of the homeless, such as the, the female homeless, I was just wondering whether one could use creative writing um, to try to illustrate some of the issues that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, James, I really liked the comment about a group of, a small group of committed people being able to create change whatever change came about because of boardroom level decisions um i think we often face the difficulty of a um a disillusionment within society with um, institutions and structures particularly in the postmodern narrative that the fragmentation that we we experience in in uh the breadth of societies globally i think can make people think what can little me do about this and I think it would be good to see uh, and it's good to see how actually the breadth of your um, research projects and, and and the practicalities of those are impacting on the ground um, I would hope to see coin uh, continuing to light those small fires and uh, until we set the um, forest ablaze I agree and the good thing is about networking these people is they don't feel so alone because some would say, my view, uh, it, it, it might be the GP clinical director saying, my view is of the 30 GPs in our primary care network is shared by two others, but not the other 27. Good people who are doing you know, what they need to do in their contract, but they're not interested in what she was, was saying that was really important for her particular network. Um, but when you're connecting people across the country who are not necessarily like-minded, but have the same enthusiasm, the same drive, it, it does really strengthen um, those those small groups of enthusiasts that sometimes can be very isolated. Uh, the other thing that with enthusiasm, we, we realise that um, these people need a lot of support and encouragement because um, the, the biggest waste that I often see in, in the NHS, we always talk about waste in terms of money or estates or services, the biggest waste, which we can't get back, is if we lose the spirit, the enthusiasm of people. Yeah. So we're we're investing a lot in that. Um, the other one line is is because when, when we keep talking about um, financial balance or efficiency in the NHS, the, the biggest risk factor we're finding, in, or I've always found, the biggest risk factor, the biggest financial risk in the NHS is the morale of the staff. Don't matter what you do, if you've got a group of people who are disenfranchised, not interested, you know, get the job done and then go, uh, you know, and nothing else um, is really empowering them. Um, 
uh, part of the network is to really strengthen and support these enthusiasts and keep keep it growing. Because um, if we lose if we lose these sort of people, I don't know you know how we we're going to turn on the service to look at some of these complex care issues if many are disillusioned, tired, and we're hearing all sorts of reports, particularly from from uh, the, the Royal College of GPs today about how many general practitioners are thinking about leaving in the next um, five years or so. It's not because they've done their time, it's just they're exhausted or they've had enough. Yeah, I think we're we're definitely heading into a, a labor issue, um, nursing and, and medicine, um, which is, I think, a part of a larger grief cycle. But, um, you know, I'm curious to, to connect the dots from the demonstration sites, uh, which it was so brilliant to see this, this network of, of work, James. It's really, really fantastic to see this coming forward. With Dom and, and Lucy and Jachendra on the call, as we move towards what Paul describes as phase two um, and moving towards embedding some of this work around end of life care and developing relationships um, in the PCN, what, what can we do to move this project forward um, in, in parallel with the the work um, that's happening at the at the PCN level, we've been talking about this for for many months, and in you know I'm always keen to move towards the the next action step for for some of these um, these goals around um, the healthy um, living and healthy dying that um, that you've been working on, Paul. Um, what's what's what can we do from this group? Knowing uh, we have six minutes left. Um, the, the next stage of, of the, the project development. Well, one thought, um, you see, Paul, was that as, you know, I think, Paul, you were talking about the three phases, of the, the phase one of the sort of diagnostic design phase with the college. Um, yep. th there's a broader issue, you know, for finding PCNs in terms of um, whether it be people with long-term conditions, but end-of-life care in general. But within some of the demonstrator sites, mentioned one in Greater Manchester, but others will be looking. I know some are looking at the, the isolation, uh, elder care, frailty in in groups where there's uh, high deprivation. And again, the, 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 some of those issues are end-of-life um, uh and maybe, you know, if, if that phase one describes the design and the approach, then there may be two or three sites that would benefit from that, as well as, you know, going out more widely to um, look at end of life care through the eyes of a, you know, a population served by a, a whole network rather than just a, a, a group who are suffering through um, deprivation. We can work on that. Make a comment, Paul. Sorry, it's Lucy here. Hi, Lucy. Go hi, ahead. Hi. Um, I've been, you know, listening in very intently to um, the presentations tonight. And I mean, um, I, I'm obviously clinical and some of it is it, it's all new to me and, and the language and things like that. Um, but there's just a couple of things that I want to just, just share, I suppose. Um, what I, I don't know quite what's happening from higher, higher up above in the NHS, but, and this is quite sad, that um, we actually are now being told, um, and this is in palliative care, specialist palliative care, that we have to increase our productivity. Now, to me, productivity and palliative care are not two words that should be in the same sentence. Yeah. What other people feel about that. But when you're truly practicing palliative care, end of life care, you are not thinking about what you are producing. You are thinking about that family at that time with that person that's dying. And those of us who are, <laughs> you know, a bit older and have been in nursing and medicine, whatever your field is, for quite a long time. That is hard to stomach. And, and just, I think, picking up from 
what you said, um, James, that people are leaving the profession and professions for that very reason, because they're not actually being allowed to do the job that we were trained. We went to, to university to get trained solely in that field and be able to practice because the pressure is on to make sure that the outcome measures are ticked off and that we're producing productivity um, data. That is, that is a really hard thing to remain clinical and to have that in the background and have that pressure when you're trying to practice high and give high quality care. I wonder if we should have a whole coin meeting on that question, actually. Anyone have a <laughs> stab at that? I'd be very interested in what, you know, what people's thoughts are, but this is, and, and this has been happening for at least the last 17 years, this in the NHS. This is what I can remember when I worked in Brighton. This is not a new concept. But where are we going if this is what the government want when we're trying to deliver high quality care that we can only do once? We cannot, we do not get a second chance. We can only do it once with one person. We are all going to die and we should all be allowed. Your homeless, homeless people, the homeless population um, who I've cared for, every, everybody, it doesn't matter what you are, who you are, we should all be entitled to have a good death. A light we are brought into the world, we should be able to leave the world with the same services and same uh, quality. But that's the end of my sermon. <laughs> leave Tony, Dominic, any little go at that? Um, yes. Gosh. You've got 30 um, seconds, and to, I'm sure good, both Labour parties will be both. Good point, sorry sorry good, to end good on that. Well made. But, it's, but it's, it's reality. It's reality now in practice. Yes, I, I, I absolutely take that point. Uh, it's a good point, well made. And I'm not up with how you measure productivity in the NHS, but also how you measure outcomes. And a good death is a good outcome. And how is that? How is that, well, not measured, but how is it valued? Christine? Oh, I guess my thought on this, um, there's a lot of system um, in place to actually measure quality um, in dying. But um, throughout my practice, I will always ask the patient and the family, um, just a simple thought, what, what is good death meant to them? And just work on that in a, in a very simple level. Yeah. Jerry? Difficult to ask the person that's died though, isn't it? If they had a good death. You can't, you can't yeah. do that. We, yeah. we, can't, we can never ask somebody. We can only observe them having that day, can't we? And ask the family, of course. This is going to come back round, isn't it? There's an ideological thing, whether the health and healthcare is, a, is an engineering model, a machine you can fix and you can make it work by flogging people harder, or whether you get multidisciplinary teams to stand back and think more thoughtfully about what health means in this context. Yeah. My thinking is if we can think through some outcomes that can be measured at PCN level, in the way that Raj did with diabetes in Ealing, we can show how a thoughtful, collaborative thing that engages pharmacists and undertakers and people to do the kind of thing that Lucy's describing can produce outcomes in terms of things like uh, dying at home, uh, hospital admissions, carers that don't become sick, um, families that feel comfortable with the, the, the shared understanding they had. I don't know how we're going to do this. We'll have to think it through. But um, almost impossible to do by simply hitting people. You know, you know, I, I, I agree. And I, you know, I, I look at the, the quadruple aim and all the pressures. Um, these are, we can measure, you know, I really appreciate Christine um, from her practice saying there are quality of life measures, there are quality of death measures, there are softer kinds of measures, if, if you're a certain kind of scientist to, to say that 
Engagement matters and is measurable. The family experience matters and is measurable. And if we can remember to use some of the language that the demonstrator sites in James projects need, to introduce some of that language that's measurable, then we can help with the productivity measures to shift the language to a value base that, that is helpful for feeling like you are providing the kind of care you need and you have a measure for it. Um, that measuring isn't the problem, it's the terminology of gathering the kind of meaningful and purposeful information that we need to make even better decisions to close the gaps that we're trying to. And, and you know, I think these kind of conversations are really important because we can begin to, to work alongside the demonstrator sites um, to deliver the language that's needed to show that this works. Thank you, Laura. It is about language, it's about narrative, and it's about, uh, I get back to value and, and, and what's valuable in terms of providing healthcare generally and specifically end of life care. It's impossible to measure, unless you're gonna look at avoiding hospital, acute hospital admissions and stuff like that. It's really hard to measure on narrow terms and I think we should be talking about the language and the narrative and what matters. Look, we're out of time. Can we think on this one for the next month? Next month we'll be having Jerry will be uh, speaking to us about um, restorative justice and the same issues apply there. I, I want to leave you with one thought which I came across the other day that made my jaw drop <clears throat> that I think is inside this conversation. And that is a formal complaint that was made <clears throat> the community services by the family because the palliative care nurse had talked with the patient about what the patient wanted, which wasn't what the family wanted, and the patient had full capacity. The very thought that the family, I was, as I heard this, I thought the very thought that anyone could feel so entitled to overrule the person that's dying and decide for them what they wanted at all, but then feel so sure of their ground that they were then able to make a formal complaint because the palliative care nurse then spoke to the patient. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could develop some outcome measure that that didn't happen. To be continued. Everyone is welcomed here to stay the next 10 minutes while we discuss what the hell we're going to be doing tomorrow because each, you know, this organic nature of coin means that that's what's going to happen. For those of you who are logging off now, thank you ever so much for being here. And we'll be working with anyone who wants to work on phase one or two or three. You never know that they don't have to happen in a linear progress. And as with the number of people who we thought were going to be here, but will be here tomorrow, but obviously aren't here today. Laura? Yeah, we'll see you in about a month. Stay tuned um, for uh, email from Lucy about the next date. Um, it's usually about the end of the month. It's usually around a Thursday. If you um, have opinions and thoughts about different dates um, that you want to be here and can't, um, let us know. If you want to um, stay in the conversation um, and have others that you want to bring into the conversation, let us know. Um, and we'll just keep yeah. talking. There certainly are people who want to be here but can't on Thursdays. Um, and we also need to speak to Jerry, of course, about this so that the date matters. And then there's November as well when Liz from Liverpool will be speaking. So, see a few of you in a few moments, and everyone else, see you soon, and have a wonderful next Thanks day. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Thank you.